And everybody said amen. Oh, hallelujah. Our God is great and glorious.
wonderful time here Friday night uh, with our children's ministry service. And if you were here, you know the Spirit of the Lord was in this building. And uh, we felt the Holy Ghost and felt the energy of all of these children loving the Lord, worshiping the Lord as, as much as they could and know how. And uh, we just really appreciated the organized effort put forth by <clears throat> children's ministry led by Jasmine Perez. They had a great, great time. So Friday night, we baptized four children, and one of them received the Holy Ghost baptism. It's a great weekend. We're going to do it again soon. If we could stand to our feet. I am starting a new series today, and I'm not saying that I'm going to stick with this series every time I step in the pulpit. As I feel it, I'll deal with it, which may be several Sundays in a row. And if I feel to get off of it, get on something else, or break from it, I will. But I, I, I really have been contemplating this for a while, and I feel like the timing is right. Uh, the name of this series is basically... 15 life-changing questions from the Bible. You know the Bible's full of questions. And we're going to look at 15 of them. Uh, today I'm titling this, <clears throat> How Long Halt Ye Between Two Opinions? How Long Halt Ye between two opinions. I'm reading 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. The Bible says, And Elijah came unto all the people, these were the Jewish people gathered there, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? And then he challenged them. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. How long halt ye between two opinions? Let's pray. God, we come before you. We thank you for all that we have felt this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to gather as families and have great food and fellowship this evening. But right now, Lord, we are focused on more serious things. We want to hear and receive the word of the Lord. We want the word of God to penetrate deep. Lord, to get to where we are really living. I'm asking God that you would help me to say what needs to be said. And Lord, help us, Lord, to take and receive it, and put it to work in our lives and be better people by it. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. There is something about <clears throat> asking questions. Asking questions is actually one of the best approaches you can use in solving problems and seeking solutions. For instance, questions create curiosity. And curiosity creates ideas and research. And then ideas and research end up creating innovation, and solutions. Did you know in your Bible, depending on who you read after, there are between 3,200 and 3,300 questions in the Bible. Uh, I didn't take time to add them all. So uh, somebody's right there. Somewhere around 3,300 questions in the Bible. Many of those questions are questions that come from God to man. And of course, anytime God asks a question, you already know God knows the answer. He does. 
So his question isn't about seeking information, but his questions have to do with revealing what's in the heart. You know, the story of Elijah is so intriguing to us. In fact, his whole life is full of miracles and the supernatural. You know, there was this challenge that was made to Israel's king. King Ahab and Queen Isabel of Israel had lured the Jewish people into worshiping the Phoenician idol they called Baal. And when you go back a few chapters, you find that Elijah came on the scene three and a half years earlier and basically pronounced a drought on the land. We also know that then Elijah disappeared. Ahab looked for him here and there, far and near, couldn't find him. At first, Elijah was hiding, and the Bible describes the setting where he was hid away and was fed supernaturally by a, a group of ravens or birds while he reclined along a brook. And then the Bible tells us after that, God told him to go into Phoenicia, and there he met a widow who basically fed him with a little handful of meal and a little bit of oil for months on end, another miracle. And now out of nowhere comes Elijah. He has reappeared and is now challenging Israel and challenging King Ahab to a contest between deities on a mountain called Carmel. The God of Israel, Yahweh, would be in competition to the Phoenician God, Baal, and let the best deity win. And when you read about the circumstances, Elijah said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And King Ahab and Jezebel were pleased with the contest, pleased with the location for the contest because Mount Carmel was on the edge of Phoenician territory overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. They were also pleased about the contest because with so many Phoenicians in the area, Jezebel was back in her old stomping ground because you'll find if you read that she was actually a Phoenician herself. And so Baal being the resident god of the Phoenicians, they were happy and had faith that their god God would prevail. Baal was the Phoenician god known as the god of fertility and the god of rain. Lightning was considered to be Baal's chief weapon of choice. And so Elijah's challenge to Baal on Mount Carmel would have been meant to insult and of course to expose Baal as nothing more than just a dead deity. There was also the challenge to Israel's people. The people evidently were open to serving either Baal or Yahweh. They were open whichever way the odds fell. They were ready and willing to serve whoever proved himself 
to be the supreme God. For the people of Israel, Yahweh was the true God and Baal was nothing more than an impotent imposter or maybe Yahweh was nothing more than just a wish and Baal was God. Either way they went, they seemed to be satisfied with the results. And it's that mindset and it's that attitude that Elijah took them to task over. He said, you cannot be double-minded in this thing. You must stop this. Now, when you read back in the passage, in the opening verse, uh, there's that word halt. How long halt ye between two opinions? That word halt, it means to hop. It means to limp. It means to hesitate. So in other words, he was asking them, how long are you going to remain divided? How long are you going to hesitate between Baal and Yahweh? He was very possibly asking like a bird hopping around In a tree, how long are you going to hop around from branch to branch, unable to make up your mind? And so Elijah was declaring, there comes a day, there comes a time where you have to choose who you will serve and who you will devote yourself to. You cannot serve both Yahweh and Baal. And so here is Elijah standing alone in front of 450 prophets of Baal, all of the king's entourage, the politicians and the courtiers, and of course, uh, those that were in power at the time. They were on one side and Elijah was on the other side himself. Can you imagine how that would have Felt everybody's on one side of the argument and you are on the other. I believe all of us at one time or other, we can sense and feel that we must be somehow alone. We can kind of get an idea of how Elijah must have felt because we at times have had to stand alone on our own principles, on our own beliefs and values. It just seems like in the day in which we live, so few people really want to serve God. It seems like maybe you feel you're the only one around trying to live a good, clean life for the Lord. Maybe it seems to you at times that almost everybody you know, they seem to be blessed in their sin and in their rebellion. It seems like Satan's tactic at times is to try his best to convince us that you indeed are alone on the mountain like Elijah. Sometimes it can feel like, why bother? Why try? Why fight it? Everybody's doing it. Everybody's got it. Everybody's getting away with it. You ever feel that way? But yet the truth of the matter is, the Bible says there were 7,000 more in Israel who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Eli just, just didn't know that they were there. You know, I I hope to encourage you this morning. Did you know that there are more spirit-filled people on the planet today than at any time in this world's history? Did you know that? Did you know that they have crunched the numbers, Pew Research, among others, and have discovered that there are over a hundred million tongue talkers around the world? In other words, you're not here in the corner looking out, feeling all alone. (coughs) There are more apostolic people striving to live a good, clean life than at any time 
in history. In other words, you're not in this by yourself. You are not alone. There is a litany of people who really do love the Lord, who share your values, who believe what you believe. Now's the time not to bend or bow. Now's the time not to give up on what you know is right. In other words, don't follow the crowd, but let the crowd follow you. It's been also said that those who follow the crowd usually get lost in it too. You see, there was a challenge to Israel's king. There was a challenge to Israel's people. There was also a challenge to Baal's prophets. When you read the passage, you discover that Elijah gave the prophets of Baal every possible advantage. They said, Who wants to go first? Elijah said, you pick. And obviously it was to Baal's advantage, the Phoenicians' advantage, that they go first. Elijah let them choose which bullock amongst the two to be their own sacrifice. Let them choose first. He let them also go first and choose the altar and how it was built to their own liking and specifications. He also gave them all the time in the world to hear back from their God, Baal. In fact, Elijah gave them over six hours for God, their God, to speak. You read the passage. They prayed, they wept, they danced for hours around their altar. The Bible says they even cut themselves with knives trying to get Baal's attention. You know what they were doing? They were actually adding their own blood to the blood sacrifice that was already on the altar to Baal. They were hoping the increased sacrifice and commitment would coax Baal to speak or in this in this particular circumstance, answer by fire. The Bible also says after a while, after Elijah provoked them at lunchtime, the Bible says some of them jumped up on the altar themselves. Here I am, send the lightning, pour out the fire. I'll be a sacrifice myself. They begged Baal. To produce his legendary lightning and thunder. And yet, nothing happened. Even with a dare. Even with shedding their own blood. They couldn't get Baal to show up. So the Bible says after a while, the people lost interest in Baal's response. Baal's boast. They began to doubt and question whether Baal was even real or not. The Bible says as the day progressed in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 29, the Bible says there was no response, there was no answer, and no one paid attention. That's in the NIV. By the end of the day, nobody's even paying attention to them. All this work and effort and sacrifice and dance and shout and hollering and screaming and bloodshed. Nothing had happened. When Elijah confronted Israel with this challenge concerning why halt ye between two opinions, we need to make up our mind today, he said. The Bible says there was no response. Nobody said anything. The reason nobody said anything is because nobody had anything to say. It was nothing worth saying. 
What else do you say when you know you've been pinned to the wall? What else do you do as God's people when you know Yahweh God is true in your heart of hearts, but yet it's easier to stand with the crowd and see what else might happen? And so they couldn't say anything. And so there was this challenge to Elijah's God. The Bible says at the time of the evening sacrifice, at three o'clock in the evening, the Bible says, all right, boys, your time's up. And the Bible says he went and repaired the altar, picked out 12 specific stones, each of them representing the 12 unified tribes of Israel. And he picked out the bullock, slaughtered it, cut it in pieces, put it on the wood, put it on the sacrifice. And then the Bible says, very uniquely, dig a ditch around the altar. And they did. And then he had 12 barrels of water brought in. There was a spring on top of Mount Carmel. It's still there today. And they took that water and they poured it all over the sacrifice. They soaked it down. And then after a 63-word prayer, Boom! The lightning fell. And in a flash, the sacrifice was consumed. The wood disappeared. The stones dissipated. And that entire altar vaporized all the way down to the bedrock. Nothing left. In other words, that's the way God likes to work. He wants you to know that after it's all said and done, it's God that did the work and not man. Not our wisdom, not our intellect, not our brawn, but it's God who loves to wait until everything is gone, until all hope has been shredded, until you're at the end of your rope, and then the Lord loves to step in and supernaturally take over. And when he does his work, nobody's going to get that glory. Nobody's going to get that credit, but God himself. God loves to show up and show out. And he's good at both. You're going to have times where it seems like the deck is stacked against you. There are going to be days you feel like the odds are against you. And the Lord loves to remind you that he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. And when he gets good and ready, he's going to step in and act. And when he does, he wants you to remember he always has the last say and the last laugh. And that's what happened here. There's also a challenge to today's generation. Not just to Elijah's God, not just to Israel's people, not just to Israel's king. But there's a challenge also to today's generation, the day we live in. How long do you halt between opinions. That question has been asked for generations. Over and over and over again. Generations have been asked the question. When are you going to make up your mind? How long are you going to try to live in two worlds? You know anybody trying to live in two worlds? Trying to be one thing at church and one thing at work? Should I go there? You know, there are so many people in the world, almost everybody's a Christian. But what's amazing is that, you know, we want to serve the Lord when it's convenient. But yet we also want the right to serve self when it suits us. 
People want to be saved, but people also want to sin. Am I telling the truth? Everybody wants to go to heaven. But you'll also find that so many people also want to raise a little H-E-L-L too. There are people, they want the right to bless the Lord when they're happy. But yet they also want the right to curse the Lord when they're angry. Oh, come on, I need a little help this morning. I think I'm in an apostolic church here today. They want the right to pray when they need something. And yet they want the right to play when it suits their fancy. And I'm telling you, you can't live in both those worlds. Like the Lord said through Elijah, you got to make up your mind. It's either going to be Yahweh or Baal. It's either going to be the church or the world. Oh, come on, somebody. We got to decide. We got to choose. We got to make up our mind. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. People have a skewed perspective when it comes to this business of what constitutes living for Jesus Christ. They live for themselves all week long and then come on Sunday and shout. And it's a little deeper than that. Did you know that Jesus Christ made it crystal clear that if you aren't actively For him, then you are automatically against him. Did you know that? Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. 30. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. And so for people who are trying to ride this thing out and straddle the fence and enjoy both worlds, you need to understand it. You can't live for Satan and you can't live for the Savior too. You have to decide who you're going to choose, how you're going to live. If you are not actively pursuing Jesus Christ in a viable, ongoing relationship, Jesus said... You're actually opposing me. We can't straddle the fence. In fact, you can't live in both those worlds. Reason I say that is have you ever tried to straddle a split rail fence? You won't stay there long. It's either Yahweh or Baal. There is no room in the universe for two omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent deities. For us, if Jesus Christ is not the supreme Lord and mighty God, that means that someone or something else is. Can't be both. Can you imagine 450 prophets of Baal frantically jumping and dancing and shouting and screaming at the top of their lungs trying to get the attention of a God that doesn't even exist? But that's what they were doing. You see... The world carnally chases after their own pursuits, what they think is going to bring them happiness and contentment. They're pursuing attention. They're pursuing affection. They're pursuing accomplishments, thinking that if I can just get those, I'll be happy. 
And they're like those prophets of Baal, screaming and hollering and dancing and chanting and running. And at the end of the day, there's no response, there's no answer, and no one's paying any attention. At the end of that person's life, when you think about it, the person who has pursued the world, the flesh, and the devil with all gusto and strength. They get to the end of their life and they realize I have nothing to say because there is nothing left to say. They have nothing to show and they have nothing to say. People who choose Baal over Yahweh, God over the flesh, or flesh over God, they are left empty, they are left unfulfilled, they don't have any purpose, they have wasted their life on a lie. And like Israel, there's nothing else left to say. Then there's this challenge to the apostolic church. Didn't see any of this till I started studying this out. You know, when you think about it, Elijah could have very easily prayed for rain instead of fire. He could have also prayed for rain first and then fire last. But when you go in the scripture, you find that Elijah prayed for fire first. If he had prayed for rain first, he probably would have appeased the wrath of King Ahab quite a bit because that's why Ahab was hunting him. Change your prophecy. Let the rains fall again. He could have pleased Jezebel and Ahab if he had only prayed for rain first. Would have gained him favor with the potentates. And yet, you see, Elijah was more concerned about Israel's revival than he was with Israel's relief. They had been three and a half years without water. Most of their domestic animals had already died off. They were desperate for water. But Elijah was more concerned about reviving the nation of Israel rather than refreshing the nation of Israel. Revival for the people was more important than water for the plants. And this is what we need to get out of this. <clears throat> Fire always precedes rain. In this account, Elijah prayed for the fire to fall first and then later in the day he went to the top of the mountain. If you remember, he prayed repeatedly until there was finally a cloud the size of a man's hand and he rushed off the mountain and ran to Samaria ahead of Ahab's chariot. And there was a deluge that fell that day. And so the fire comes first before the rain. This is exactly why in your Bible you'll always see repentance first. The fire falls where there's judgment over our past and over our sins. There's always repentance first, the fire, before there is the refreshing or the Holy Ghost infilling. That's why nobody ever gets the Holy Ghost until they repent. That's why your baptism in water is not valid unless you have repented. Why? The fire has to fall before the rain. Another thing I noticed about this is the, the patience. And the grace of God that is extended to these people. When you think about it. Here they've been serving Baal. They have followed after Ahab and Jezebel. 
They have easily transferred their affections from the God of Israel, Yahweh, to that of a dead deity named Baal. And if it were me and I were God, I would be done with the mess. I would start over with a different people. <clears throat> Someone more appreciative. Someone more spiritual. But God doesn't seem to work that way. Instead of the fire that fell that day falling on the people... The fire instead fell upon the sacrifice. What does that tell me? That tells me that is a type and a shadow of what happened at Calvary. Instead of the wrath of God falling upon the people for their sins, the wrath of God fell upon Christ hanging on a cross. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for a substitutionary sacrifice. I'm glad for the finished work of Calvary. Let's stand to our feet. What you find in this story is that God didn't answer just one prayer that day. But God answered both prayers of Elijah that day. God answered Elijah's prayer concerning fire when it fell from heaven and incinerated the entire sacrifice and the altar and lapped up the water in the ditch around the, the sacrifice. But that's not the only prayer that God answered that day. God also answered Elijah's prayer concerning water. When you think about it, in my Bible, I can't think of any two prayers prayed in the same day more diverse and opposite than what was prayed that day. Elijah got his answer to both prayers, fire and water, water and fire, about as far apart on the spectrum as you can get. What does that tell me? That tells me that God is diverse, and distinct, and God can reach between extremes and take care of whatever you've got going on in your life that seems impossible no matter which way you look at it. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. This wouldn't be for everybody. But there are people in this building that you don't know what you're going to do if God doesn't show up soon. If the fire doesn't fall for you soon. If the rains don't come for you soon. You don't know what you're going to do. Preacher, I've got so much stuff going on in my life. I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know where to start. I don't even know which prayer to pray first. Can I tell you? It doesn't matter how many needs you've got. It doesn't matter how diverse or different your needs may be. There's a God in heaven that can take care of any of it and he can take care of all of it. God can answer any and all of our prayers in any one day 
if it so suits him. That's why in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27, the Bible says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I want us to lift our hands all over the building right now. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here. I feel conviction in this building right now. God wants to restore. God wants to refill. God wants to renew. God wants to answer some serious prayers this morning. God wants to answer a prayer. You're almost too timid to even ask him for. And I'm telling you, there's a God in